Hello, I'm Rhiannon Jones and welcome to Showcase, where we bring you the biggest and best news in art, culture, style and entertainment from here in London to Istanbul and across the world. Coming up on this week's show, Hollywood legend Dame Joan Collins will be joining us from her rather glamorous home in Saint Tropez to chat about her recent one-woman show oh, and an upcoming movie. We take an in-focus look at Henri Matisse's granddaughter, Jackie Matisse, as her stunning exhibit, Kai Time, comes to Istanbul. We're joined by Bridgerton's very own etiquette expert, Nora Windsor, for some lessons on the proper way to enjoy a British cup of tea. And my co-host, Ezra Darus, talks to Oscar-nominated British-Palestinian director, Farah Nabulsi, about her dramatic thriller, The Teacher, in our weekly Snapshot Rundown. But first, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome to the show a true Hollywood icon, Dame Joan Collins. Hello, thank you so much for joining us here on Showcase, Dame Joan. Now, you've just finished your one-woman show in the West End where you told some incredible stories about your remarkable career and you also took questions from the audience. How was that? I do take a lot of questions from the audience, which is the most fun because I really like, like doing that because they come up with... Um, all kinds of really crazy, funny, you know, questions. I bet they do. And you promised them that they could ask you absolutely anything. That's very brave. Though, is there anything you were dreading being asked? Well, I don't really like to go too much into uh, various husbands. That's <laughs> to me a bit boring. And um, I don't really like to talk about birthdays. But other than that, I, I'll talk about most anything because uh, my husband's there with me and uh, he kind of is the MC. And that's your husband, Percy. Is he there? Is he dead? No, is he there? <laughs> he is here. He is He's here. here. He's and... done all the technology here, yes. What is it like working with me? It's terrible. And how is it having your husband, Percy, up on stage with you? It must be lovely having his support there. Yes. Yes, it is. It is. He's helpful and he, he's very funny. It's basically, um, it's extemporized. It's off the cuff, most of it. And do you enjoy performing in front of a live audience? I really get a kick out of um, the live, a live audience. You know, when I went to RADA, when I was 16, I did not want to be a, a movie actress at all. I wouldn't be a stage actress. Um, the theatre has always intrigued me and I've done at least 10 or 15 plays in my lifetime. I went on tour. And um, it's just the feeling of togetherness with the audience that I really love. I love the feedback. Uh, I love the fact that they've actually come out to see me. Oh, wow, that's really nice. And I want to, I want to entertain them. And you do. And when you're up on stage, are there any questions in particular that are always asked? They always ask me, who is your favorite actor and who is the best kisser? And what do you say? I always say the same thing because it doesn't change. Paul Newman was my favorite actor and also a great friend. And he was all, also the best kisser because he didn't slobber and he didn't do the Fred kiss and he didn't do the mm, closed mouth, horrible kind of thing uh, where you bash your teeth against each other. It's very difficult, you know, kissing in films. Um, you know, it, you, you, it can look really stupid, but I think. The best kisser, of course, is Percy. Naturally. Now, I was reading in your book Behind the Shoulder Pads that you're not a very huggy, kissy person, are you? No, I was brought up in the kind of um, family that we didn't hug and kiss and we didn't hug strangers ever. I mean, it just wasn't done. I think that hugging people you don't know and kissing the people that you don't know, well, it doesn't uh, it doesn't appeal to me. Well, I'm a very huggy person, Dame Joan. If you're here in the studio, I definitely want to give you a hug. Why? I don't know. I'm just a huggy person. If I did, what would you do? I would do it gingerly. <laughs> now, I also read in your book that if women ruled the world, there'd be no wars, you said. What do you make of the state of the world right now? Well, I'm not going to comment on the state of the world because everybody knows what that is. Um, very poor. Um, but I do believe that women are more gentle 
the men, uh, they're, they're less um, aggressive. And um, I think I'll probably get a lot of flack for this, but I mean, I, I do think that they are the gentle sex and I don't think they like wars because they're the ones who have the children and have to look after the children. When you see what's going on with the children in the world today, it's more than tragic. It's horrific. It's just one of the most tragic, tragic things. And it's been going on from time immemorial. Wars usually started by men. And it is tragic. Um, now, I did want to ask, when you're not being Dame Joan Collins, what do you get up to? I love, I was brought up. I'm going to the movies at least two or three times a week. I love watching movies and I love watching when studying the brilliant actors. I mean, yesterday I watched for about the 10th time Mrs. Doubtfire with Robin Williams and Sally Fields. I mean, because they're just so good. And then we also watched um, Walter Matthau and Jack Lemmon in The Odd Couple, which makes me laugh all over again. And I watch movies like that over and over again. And you've got a movie coming out too, Murder Between Friends. Tell us about that. Um, I just finished making that in Prague, and it's an Agatha Christie-type film in which I play a sort of female, a Monsieur Poirot, and, uh, <laughs> called Francesca. And she's an ex the TV actress who has had um, a TV program solving crimes. It's um, it's very good. It's very funny. And I think it's going to be coming out at the end of the year, or early next year. It sounds fabulous. I can't wait to see it. Now, I can't let you go without asking you about Dynasty because it was an iconic series with plenty of dramatic scenes, especially from your character, Alexis Colby. Is there any particular line that you wouldn't mind teaching me from it? Well, there was a guy called Mark who was working for me. He was a tennis pro and we're having breakfast together and we have a lot of treats and some of it is caviar. And I, he's spooning it up and I say to him, that's caviar, Mark, not peanut butter. Oh, I love it. I'll give it a go. That's caviar, Mark, not peanut butter. Very good. Percy's <laughs> laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous stuff. Thank you so much, Dame Joan. Thank you for joining us here on Showcase. All the best with your upcoming movie. Thank you. Thanks again to the fabulous Dame Joan Collins there. To Istanbul now, where crowds have been flocking to see the vibrant artwork of Henri Matisse's late granddaughter, Jackie Matisse, in this week's In Focus. Coming from a long line of artistic heritage, Jackie Matisse forged her own path, making kites that danced in the wind. Her grandfather, Henri Matisse, once said, don't become an artist if you can do anything else. But she didn't listen. Her journey began in the 60s, after seeing a kite flying in New York skies. It became her epiphany moment. To me, art, perhaps you could say, is a kind of invention. In, it's an exploration of a new territory that, you, you, that inspires you. Her works now grace the interiors of Artar, one of Istanbul's major contemporary art museums. It's been a dream come true to show her kites in all their glory, thanks to the height of the building. Jackie's idea and dream was to use kites to paint the sky, in a sense, to send up lines of color into the sky that made paintings in the sky. Nobody had done that. Jackie Matisse called her kites dream forms. They were more than just toys, but rather artworks in motion. She took inspiration from her grandfather's famous cutouts and her work with her stepfather, Marcel Duchamp. But kites helped her find her own voice, away from her world-renowned relatives. All of it's about flying and floating, and she's made 200 beautiful pieces which hang on wires, small pieces, lots of, lots of different ephemeral type um, floating in the air pieces, just like she was. She was very floating and dreaming. And... One of the ideas behind the kites was to make a kite that could be flown by anybody. You don't have to be um, skilled in order to do it. You just have to 
play with the wind. Just have that idea in mind and to feel the wind on your fingers, on the line. Making the kites is the most thrilling thing to go in one direction and to, and to experiment with, let's say, a group of colors or to see what, what really suits the, the blue of the sky or what suits the, once the kites have fallen into the sea, what suits the underwater. Today, her children cherish how their mother's art shaped their childhood. Jackie was always so open and, and creative, and she made it possible for us to draw a lot and be even creative in the kitchen, do all kinds. She was very open-minded. The best part was flying the kites. The sky was a canvas upon which the kites were shown. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the sky was almost uh, the... Um, uh, uh, the, the, wall, the wall against which this artwork was being visible. Even though Jackie Matisse passed away in 2021, her kites, which blend art with nature in a unique dialogue, continue to remind us that beauty and joy can still take flight. Hatice Meryem Gelgör, TRT World, Istanbul. Stunning artwork there from Istanbul. Time now for this week's top five, and today it's our rundown of trending topical podcasts. At number five, this is not a drill. For those of you who like to face your fears head on, this highly informative podcast brings together experts on the planet's hottest and often scariest topics, including global corruption, conflicts and disinformation. Hosted by former BBC News presenter and Washington correspondent Gavin Esler. At number four, normal gossip, a deep dive into some juicy, funny and sometimes rather strange real-life gossip full of twists and turns submitted by its listeners. So if you prefer your topical news to be local and find yourself invested in drama involving complete strangers, well then normal gossip is the podcast for you. At number three, The Palestine Pod. This weekly podcast breaks down the latest Palestine-related news. It provides historical context, light-touch commentary and interviews, all with the aim of supporting Palestine liberation, justice and equality. At number two, Call Her Daddy. This is officially the most listened to podcast by women, with host Alex Cooper cutting straight to the point, asking her guests the burning questions we all want answering. Full of laughs and tears, this podcast is going from strength to strength. Even US presidential hopeful Kamala Harris has been on the show. And at number one, it's the Joe Rogan Experience, probably the biggest podcast out there right now, regularly drawing in over 11 million listeners. A true veteran of podcasting, Joe Rogan invites big name guests, including Elon Musk, Mike Tyson and Quentin Tarantino, onto the show for topical discussions on anything from politics to the paranormal. We hope that gives you some podcast inspiration. Happy listening. Well, it doesn't get much more stylish than smash hit period drama Bridgerton, with Netflix having confirmed that Series 4 is now in production. We thought it'd be a good idea to chat to the etiquette expert tasked with teaching the show stars how to be true Regency Royals. Laura Windsor, thank you very much for joining us here on Showcase. Etiquette, is that anything to do specifically with posh people or is it more no. about manners? I think everybody exactly. tends to associate the two with with poshness. Yes, I know. Is that or not? Yes, they do. And it's got nothing to do with upper class or poshness. It's to do with manners. Manners lies at the heart of etiquette. And what were the stars like when you were teaching them? Were they receptive to it? Did you have a lot of work with some of them? Or we talked about it in general. I talked about deportment and posture and how important it was. They're all interested in it because obviously I'm sure not many people have deportment lessons in their life. No. 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 Did you? Did you have lessons? Is that oh, what yes. 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 Well, no, my mother, she was very strict and okay. she was very big on how to sit up and stand and move yeah. gracefully. So I learned it from her. And how much of a difference does it make as these actors are on screen and it is a period drama? How much of a difference does it make to their oh. acting whether or not they, they, they are good at this and they can take it on? Well, they have to because they can't be 
going s- slouching around on on a you know in a regency period so it's part of their acting that they have to take on board and is etiquette very particular to britain where does it come from is it a british thing well i've actually been out on the streets asking people non-british people what is uh, who are famous for their etiquette mm-hmm. and they all say british okay and and also presumably it has something to do with our royal family I suppose so, but there are a lot of countries that have royal families. I suppose but not etiquette. No, not together. And we do follow a very strict protocol, or they do. On the royal family, uh, let's talk about Kate Middleton. It's yes. great that oh. she's uh, now back to health. Yes. And it's lovely because I know that she's incredibly popular. She's also incredibly well known for her beautiful etiquette. What makes mm. her so good at of being elegant and well-mannered and graceful. Well, obviously, she's had etiquette lessons, but she probably you was... say obviously. Is that something that you have to yes. have when you oh, absolutely. go to the royal family? If you see photos of her before, perhaps her deportment is not is a little off to what it is today. Mm-hmm. But I think she's just a very graceful person, just needed a bit of tweaking. And she does things so gracefully and and when naturally. You say tweaking, yes. for example, what might have needed tweaking? Well, perhaps her gait was a little bit less graceful. Posture. Is that right? The way oh. she was walking. Okay. Yes. So on that, is this something that you taught the Bridgerton Stars? So what was it no. specifically that you were teaching the Bridgerton Stars when it came to her? How to walk gracefully. Here, as if you're, you're gliding like a swan on a, on a pond. And how do you do that? Well, I can show you. Please do. I'd love to learn how to walk yes. gracefully. Okay. Well, what's so this? I used this and I put yeah. it at the back here. Okay. It's just a lot of people are round-shouldered and this just reminds you to keep your shoulders back pull in and then yes. presumably the point is once the pole has been removed you stay like that of course yeah like far back though well that should be how i do really that's, yes that's, that's very unnatural what do i what do i do with my hands and that is to do with uh, kate middleton as well when you ask me what has slightly changed yeah when she walks now she mm-hmm. moves her hands like this mm. she might forget sometimes and then she quickly cups her hand if you do this mm-hmm. then you know that they're there and you're not going to be fidgeting right okay so with this one or maybe you should put it on your I head I yeah ah earlier. here we are okay. okay now what am i doing now okay. brilliant your chin is parallel you're doing great now just take a few steps i mean it really doesn't feel very natural lift yeah. your rib cage a little bit that's better Whoa. yeah woohoo Two, and then yep. I do a little curtsy. Okay, now when we curtsy, it's a quick bob of the knee. You don't move the upper part of your body, it's just your knees. And it's a quick bob, just down. That's it. That's Yay! it. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to start reversing now too, just to show off. Can I do a little swing? Fabulous. Thank you very much, yes. Nora. And so the lessons continue, Nora. In front of us, we have some high tea. <laughs> what did you just say? High tea. High uh, tea. Yes, the whole world think it thinks it's yes. called high tea. Is it not? No. What's it called? Tea. Afternoon tea. Just called afternoon tea or low tea. High tea. Low tea. Yes, low okay. tea. Because the aristocrats would have afternoon tea on low sofas and low tables. Ah. Whereas high tea was born from the Industrial Revolution when workers went out to the fields or the factories. They'd come home around 6 p.m., and have supper, which huge, stodgy foods yeah. at 6 p.m. on a high table with their ale and their tea. That's why it was called high tea. So that is, in fact, tea, as uh, in dinner, yes. as in supper. Okay. Yes, and it doesn't Perfect. exist anymore. Well, that we have in front of us. Yes, tea. Afternoon, yes. Tea, afternoon tea, Laura. Tea. How would one go about starting their afternoon tea? This is actually called cream tea. Okay. It's part of afternoon tea because we're only having scones, clotted cream and jam. Yeah. So, would you like to pour for us? Oh, gosh, I feel like this is my test. Test. Okay, yes, I will pour. It's always the lady of the house who would pour the tea. So, I presume I am you the are the lady of the house, house. Certainly. And you would only pour one teacup at a time. Let's say we had five people. Tea gets cold really quickly. Okay. So, you have to look after one person at a time. And do I do that? Oh, no. No, okay. And um, shall I show you how I t- yes pick up the up and
Oh, you pinky no, finger? No, I minx and no minx and yes, I thought. It feels a bit heavy, so I'd probably do that, if I'm honest. Okay. You're still sticking that... Oh, I am. Finger. Maybe I do stick my pinky out then. Oh, oh. That was a little bit of a slurp. Now, that would do very well in China because <laughs> slurping is a form of appreciation of what you're eating <laughs> and drinking. <laughs> so how about the scones then, Laura? I'm going to offer you one. Thank you. That's very kind. Now, they are finger foods, which means that they're meant to be eaten with your fingers. Funny that. <laughs> <laughs> Even the cakes okay. and the sandwiches. To break it, what we would do is we would... Twist it. So you twist it and pull. Yes. And it should, yes. Gosh. It's lovely salty cream, isn't it? Oh, I just lick my fingers. <laughs> oh, that's all right. And I would normally offer my guest. And then I'm going to take a bite because I am very hungry. Okay. Hmm. Right. I've learned an awful lot that I'm going to carry forward in life with me. So thank you very much for joining us here at Showcase. Thank you very much. Time now for our weekly entertainment news roundup, Snapshot. UK rapper Low Key made headlines recently by going head to head with Piers Morgan about the war on Gaza on his show Uncensored. And I encourage you, in the spirit of journalistic inquiry and curiosity, to really look that up. It's already been thoroughly investigated. Low Key's been very vocal on the war in Gaza and has recently teamed up with fellow British artist Harris J to feature on their song for Palestine Freedom. Harris J and Loki have joined an ever-growing number of artists, actors and performers using their platforms to make a stand. Let's head over now to my co-host Ezra Durust in Istanbul. Hey there, Rhiannon. Thank you so much. As we all know, social media has been serving as a powerful tool for individuals and celebrities to express their solidarity with Palestine. And we often see how people try their best to come up with new ideas to support Palestinians. So let's talk about Voices for Gaza, an online platform that gives voice to the voiceless. From actors like Pedro Alonso and Khalid Abdallah to writers such as Enya No and Amanda Seals, many creatives, including musicians, artists and designers, read messages and stories from the people of Palestine. Now, let's listen to a few of them. And remember, these are the voices of children, doctors and social workers from Gaza. We came here after hearing about the arrival of flower trucks in the city. There's no flour, food or water in Gaza. We are under fire. I've been a humanitarian worker for a very long time. This is the first time I've seen such a violent war and such chaos. People are arriving in emergency wards, one on top of the other, one after the other, following the bombardments. Why is this world the way it is? Why did my father have to stand in line when he was an engineer and work his whole life to build our house? And then it was bombed. Our whole future was bombed. Now, from social media to cinema, it's another powerful tool to expose the injustices faced by Palestinians for some filmmakers. And one of them is British-Palestinian director Farah Nabulsi. When I caught up with her in Istanbul, she emphasized the importance of amplifying Palestinian voices through cinema. These are human stories that have been severely marginalized or silenced or ignored or misrepresented and that cinema, film, is such a powerful medium for, for, for giving that, you know, voice back in many ways. I can't get my head around how shocking yesterday was. Nabulsi's feature debut, The Teacher, is a human drama. It follows a Palestinian teacher navigating the delicate balance between political resistance and emotional support for his loved ones. Although she filmed in the occupied West Bank in 2022, before the current conflict escalated, Nabulsi faced both physical and emotional challenges during production. 
We were shooting in, 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 near the village of Berin, and illegal Israeli settlers had decided to come down and start burning trees, olive trees, the olive groves, in the village of Berin. Now that's something that's in our film, but it was taking place in real time while we were shooting that film. Um, uh, on another occasion, on my way to work, I, it was about five in the morning, and I pulled up on the side of the road was a couple with their five children standing in front of the rubble of their freshly demolished home. The teacher can now be seen in cinemas across the UK and Ireland. And Rhiannon, make sure to add this film to your must-see list. That's all from me now. Back to you. I certainly will, Ezra. Thank you very much, Teshik Kudla. And that's it from all of us here at Showcase. A big thank you to this week's guests, Dane Joan Collins and Laura Winsor. Next week on Showcase, we'll be speaking to a British fashion icon and we chat to the star of the West End musical hit I Wish You Well, based on Gwyneth Paltrow's infamous ski trial court case. Ezra will be catching up with the legendary pianist and composer Ludovico Einaudi and we'll be filling you in on all the latest entertainment news in our weekly Snapshot Roundup. See you then.